Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. My name is Judithia Pearson. I'm a professor of media entrepreneurship at the Creative Media Industries Institute here at Georgia State University. And our conversation today is about artificial intelligence and Afrofuturism. And joining us uh, in person is the amazing Terry J. Vaughn, actress, director, and producer. I also want to add consummate businesswoman. I have followed her career for some time and she's absolutely amazing. And then also joining us virtually, uh, we have with us Adele Loye. She is an experiential creative. And then we also have joining us Ojo Odo, and she is a data analyst. And so we're looking forward to having them add their expertise to this conversation, particularly as we talk about the fusion of these two worlds. I'm sorry. <laughs> so first, I just want to give each of uh, the panelists an opportunity to add a little bit more to the introduction that I just did um, and add a little bit about just this topic in general, just what made you want to do this panel, um, and anything you just want to open up with. So I'm going to start with Terry right here. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> um, so what, what made me want to do this panel, look, I'm a huge girlfriend supporter, mm -hmm. first of all. And usually when people that I respect, my peers, when they call on me, to do something, if I can, I do. So, being honest, because Moji asked me, and I was, and I was available, and I said yes. And that's a great reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, just as far as the topic with AI and all the stuff that's happening, um, you know, there's a lot to figure out. There's a lot to say. It's a lot to learn. So I really wanted to hear what the other women on the panel had to say about it because we're all figuring it out. Yeah. And just as an artist and a content creator, an actress, a director, I want to figure this out because I love my job. I love what we do. I love creating content that connects people, that... Um, that tell stories that need to be heard, um, that feature faces that need to be seen. I, that's why I do what I do. And learning to, um, I wanna learn how to preserve and protect this as we grow te technically. Te technically, yes. in the world. Technological, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, because you can't stop it. Mm -hmm. You can't stop technology. It's right. going to happen. Right. So how do we make it make sense for us? Yes. So, I love that. Here. Okay. Ojo, let's bring you into the conversation. Tell us just a little bit more about what you do, and then what made you want to do this panel? Okay, so I just finished my master's in artificial intelligence, and I worked on a project that tried to automate movie scripts. And in this project, I was very intrigued with how AI can help the system um, produce movies and we can also make decisions based on these um, scripts that are automated by AI. So that was something I was really interested in. And that immediately, uh, Mojisola reached out to me. I was like, amazing, amazing. This is something that I've worked on and put on, so I jumped on it. Awesome, awesome. And is Adele still with She's, 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 coming, back she's, she's coming, coming back in. She's coming back in. So we're going to keep the conversation going, but just cue me when she's back in if I miss her because I definitely want to get her to chime in a little bit so I can properly kind of bring her into the conversation we're having. What I would like to do first is just level set just a little bit. I don't want to assume that everyone who's joining us is clear on what we mean when we say Afrofuturism uh, and when we talk about artificial intelligence. So not a deep dive, but just this, this some broad strokes to bring us to the same place in time in this conversation. I, you know, I want to start with the Afrofuturism term. It was officially coined in the mid-90s, somewhere around 1994. However, Afrofuturism has been around, I would say, as long as Africa has been around. You know, in a nutshell, the way I typically define it um, is from the point of view of the diaspora. Afrofuturism is about how we see ourselves, past, present, and future, but also this sense of home. Where is it? You know, and that can 
vary quite drastically depending on who you're talking to in the African diaspora, what their point of view is, where they, where they were born, uh, where their family has toiled for generations. For me, that would be in the United States of America. And when I look through this lens of our history before slavery, um, it's very different from my friends in Tanzania when they think about Afrofuturism or African futurism is the way they typically coin it. Um, but what we are clear about is this space of what we consider imagining or reimagining the future and what home may look like for us, in addition to many other things. Afrofuturism also uh, historically has these elements of liberation. You know, that liberation theology is always going to be a cornerstone of, of this conversation. And again, depending on the history and the story and the genealogy of the person that you speak to about Afrofuturism, they may come from different directions, but we typically end up in the same space um, beyond survival. But what does thriving look like? Particularly if you've had the crucible of oppression, which many of us have. Um, but also, what does it look like to love 100 years from now? What does it look like to be free? What does it look like to live? And what does it look like to maximize your potential and, and your community? But when we also add or layer this element of artificial intelligence, we're really talking about being able to replicate the way the human mind thinks and the way the human mind makes decisions. And I will say we have this ongoing debate academically um, at the university level, but then as creatives and storytellers, we have, <laughs> oh, good, good, good. I'm going to bring her in in just a second, but just closing out these thoughts on artificial intelligence. When you start talking about replicating the functions of the human mind, that could be an amazing tool to simplify things, to make things more efficient. But then we also have these concerns that we uh, think about on an ethical basis. And so we'll weave all of this into the conversation. Technology is a tool and artificial intelligence is probably here to stay, you know? Mm -hmm. It's how we move forward with it in our storytelling and in our creation, particularly generative AI. I know a lot of the concern is, do we remove creatives from the conversation and the equation and the economy of, of creating derivative works or original works. I am ambivalent about some things, as Terry <laughs> said, it's, a, it's an evolutionary conversation. So I'm gonna be, it's gonna be interesting to hear everybody's points of view on this. So now I wanna pause and welcome back Adele. And what I was asking earlier was tell us a little bit more about what you do, and then why did you wanna do this panel on this topic? Um, did we lose our kid? No, we still don't have audio. We don't have audio? We see you, yeah. and we are going to hear your voice soon. She got tired. <laughs> so, yeah, so, and, and if that's the best we can do, that's what we will roll with for now. Feel free to chat. Feel free to chat with us, so, because we definitely want your voice. So somebody kind of just keep me uh -huh. <laughs> aware of what's happening behind me. Um, but let's talk a little bit to Ojo. Can you still hear us and speak as well? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, I oh, actually. Oh, 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 can we hear Adele? We, we have you. Yes. Okay, Adele, let's. Yes, okay, so let me pause and give you the floor. Okay, so hi, my name is Adele Noye. I'm calling, I'm dialing in from London. Um, I. Work for, and I've been working with. Sorry. Um, yes. We yes. can hear you. Yes. My, my <laughs> well, I know this AI is like, I mean, I'm sure it's been going on for a while, but it, it's been gaining popularity um, at the moment. So I was called in, you know, because I had a, I was inter interested in Afrofuturism. And um, I just noticed that any time I try to generate images of me or my people or what I wanted to do, I was getting very negative images or the images that were coming out weren't of like high quality standards. And then you start thinking of what's going on, who are, who, where are these, where are they getting these images from? Who is telling the AI system 
that this our images, these negative images are me. So, I mean, I try, you know, sometimes you have to like re readjust the how to now prompt the generative AI. So I started giving it, look, I like images in, in the sense of like, um, maybe, um, I gave it some popular artists, you know, like maybe black artists that I wanted to generate these images. And by, by it doing that, it started giving me positive images. So I started, you know, I started training the model myself with the data that I had, and I noticed that things were changing, and that's something that we need to start taking control of. We start, need to start taking control of what you give out, mm -hmm. because if you depend on other people to define you, you're going to be very, you know, you're going to come into a lot of problems. Even your best friend can define you. If, if you cannot speak up and tell people, this is who I am, this is where I'm coming from, and this is the data I'm in. You're going to have a big problem. So, um, in terms of um, training sets, data sets, um, are we, am I still on? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that, that what brought my attention to, you know, this Afrofuturism um, in terms of, and also training data, using the right data, the biases in, and ethics in, um, Generative data, oh, generative AI. So that's why I'm here on this panel right now. Thank you. You bring up some great points about data sets and training them, and I'm going to bring Ojo into the conversation in a minute where this is concerned. But AI really is only as good as the data points, um, the source of those data points, and then also, you know, how we choose to use them. One of the concerns I heard you mention was ethics, and I mentioned that a second ago too. But when we start thinking about large quantities of information being used by whoever the programmers are to train AI models to, to have this data input, and whether it's going through machine learning, deep learning, and I'm sure Ojo will talk about some of these terms in a moment, whether it's supervised or unsupervised is a concern that I have. Is someone looking at the quality of the source that the information comes from? Are they looking at how the machine or how uh, AI tools are synthesizing and then generating new content in a way, for instance, when we, you just talked about looking for images that were representative. And I remember a couple of years ago when our students first started playing around with like chat GPT and mid journey and and sometimes using the output for for submissions for assignment submissions and we were really having to look at what was going to be acceptable what was not acceptable but I do remember the early conversations about I just typed in beauty and everybody on there had you know porcelain skin or I typed in um, um, futuristic hairstyles and everybody had straight hair. And they started playing around with prompts to see what would come out and were very disenchanted for some time. Now in two years I've seen these tools come a long way in, in capturing uh, black beauty and representation um, physically as well as when we look at text AI. Um, language, stories, whatever is being generated being pretty good, but again, the data is only as good as the inputs as well as the prompts used. One of the things we notice though is sometimes bias and hate speech is not easily weeded out. And so if it's unsupervised artificial intelligence generating stories or poetry or treatments or whatever it is, that can be problematic, you know? And so I want to bring Ojo into this conversation about data points and your thoughts on AI application in this world, this creative world that we live in, then I want to hear Terry's point of view about what she's seeing happening as well. Okay, I feel like AI is the future. I would say AI is the future. Um, in terms of um, generating images, text, um, information, AI really um, doesn't work on its own. It's based on um, the information we feed it. So it's, it's just like a coded gaze, like how the data is put into this machines for training and learning and then to generate outputs. 
So, for example, for I would say, um, um, I'll give an instance of the um, images that Adele just mentioned. Mm -hmm. For example, you could have um, um, a data set, like a biased data set, um, mm -hmm. is used to train the model. And then uh, it tends to be, the, the output tends to uh, be biased. It's like a stereotypical model. It's biased towards a particular feature that dominates the data set. The data set. So for example, if you have um, um, information that you want and then you have features that you're trying to explore, um, the, the larger picture would, would all, always dominate the, the data. So your output will be less. So for example, we have black people, we have women in particular, and children who their images are not fed into this um, live database. And when this um, generative AI, or when AI is used to gain outputs, we tend to have like a bias towards the um, information that is less. I did not forget that. Mm -hmm. I did, I did. <laughs> yes. So that, that's how AI comes in. And in order to deal with issues like this, we need to watch the type of data that goes into um, our models. Um, there are issues where people are, have been arrested um, because they were incorrectly, um, incorrectly captured or based on the data that they have in the information, like in the database, where they have people um, where they say people committed crimes based on how they look, based on their features, and their features are less uh, prominent in the data set. So there are issues like that. We have issues where people have been discriminated because of their skin colors, their tones, and this is all because of the data, base, the data set that has been used to train these models. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, in terms of representation, you raised good points about it's what we feed it, but then I think about people who aren't actually training AI models. They're using them. Someone else has already fed that data in. Um, we do have concerns about them understanding their ethical and moral responsibilities, not just around representation, but also copyrights. That's a whole nother conversation <laughs> that also starts to come in. And I'm curious, from Terry's point of view, I saw yesterday on CNN, there's a group of writers in the Authors Guild who are suing open AI platforms mm -hmm. because their works, their literary works, are being used to train AI models without their permission or compensation. And even though some of them are not 100% opposed to their content being used to train, they want some oversight <coughs> on what that is going to be, but they want to be paid. <laughs> and they want to be paid. Um, and I saw, you know, of course, it was a lot of big, well-known writers. Mm -hmm. One of them um, was, um, I, I want to say his name right, R.R. R. Martin, George R.R. Yeah. R. Martin, uh, Game of Thrones series. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw his name as part mm -hmm. of that list. But what are your thoughts on from the representation to the copyright and compensation yeah. perspective. So that's where I, I feel like there's a lot of issues mm -hmm. with it. Um, again, I think that with technology, there are ways that we can use it that is very useful, which we all have grown to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, when the internet first became a thing and how it's developed now. But when we think about like, just on our iPhones or whatever. Like whenever you're talking about a topic, whatever, and it pops up on your phone automatically, <laughs> right? So ah, with, with AI and these chat programs or whatever, like you guys are saying, depending on who's feeding this material, right. when a student or, you know, whoever goes in to get information about something specific, um, especially, just not especially anything, just to anyone. Um, looking for beauty, looking for, so it's all based on who's trained this program, yeah. so what's going to be spat back out at me is something from somebody else's mind being typed out. So I just think it's really dangerous just as a creative, like there's no there's no emotion as an artist we there's emotion there's there's so many things that go into the words that we write mm -hmm. 
into the characters that we play. There's so much internally that goes on for us to give ourselves our personal experiences and all this stuff that mm -hmm. we put into our craft that can never be captured by a computer. Yes, they can say words, but depending on who's trained this app or whatever it's called, I don't even know what to call this stuff. <laughs> it's dependent on who's trained it, on what's going to be spat out. And I just feel like it's not emotionally tied to anything. Mm -hmm. And as an artist, when you lose the emotion behind the work, then it's really, it, it, it has no power. It, it loses its, I don't know, it loses its authenticity, its purpose. Mm -hmm. Art is supposed to challenge, supposed to uplift, supposed to um, inspire and supposed to yeah, teach yeah. and I just don't see I, I don't know how that can happen if we're only using AI to spit out scripts and stories and stuff yeah. you're going to need the human contact with that no matter what and I will say like many uh, emerging technologies that have entered the space in the last couple of decades there's always a valid space for concern, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about ethics and morals. And then there's also valid space for the people who work in these spaces now. Any concerns that they have about elimination or too much supplementation to the work that they do, I think those are valid concerns. Mm -hmm. But um, to Ojo's point earlier, we know AI, I don't think it's just the future, it's also now. Okay, <laughs> yeah. There are definitely some things yeah. now. And I think we've got to find this place of symbiosis that is going to not just assuage concerns, but truly amplify everything you said about inspiring, um, making sure the emotion is still there, making sure the, the hallmarks of art are not removed, mm -hmm. and, and the human factor, that that's not removed from the equation. Um, I, I feel like there is a happy medium we will get yeah. to over time. But I want to add a delay into this conversation as this, um, this, this part of this conversation kicked off with some things you said early on about just your experience as a creative experimenting as well as, as using and incorporating this output. Talk to us a little bit beyond representation. What are your thoughts about copyrights and compensation? And then who who is behind the training of these models, these AI models? Um, um, I, I know now they're, um, especially in the European Union, they're trying to do the copyright for artists. Artists are complaining that you know people are generating images. Um, companies are using their images without their permission because you know normally you say in the represent, you know, I would like to be like Picasso, I would like to be in, you know, so the, the art will generate art in Picasso. So, um, I mean, in the beginning it's quite creative, but as I said, you know, these are artists' work, you know, mm -hmm. especially, and it's very personal, and sometimes the generative art even looks better than the artist's work, because the individuals who put the prompt in will now give the art a story on. So, um, I mean, that's a, it's a fine line to right. um, do, you know, because as, as a creative, you, you're, you're so excited that this is, looks like the artist's work, but at the, at the same time, the artist is not getting the credit for it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, this is more of uh, legal terms, um, and, it, you know, it kind of goes both ways, um, but that is how they build the system. It's not right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the artist should have credits, just like yeah. back, in the, back in the old days when you know they had our people signing up with record companies and they did not get credit for their work, even up to today, because you know probably they will have new laws 50 years from now that did not include them from back then. So these are considerations once you look into it. Um, I don't have any, I don't want a legal person, but right. it's something that, you know, I mean, every time your name is mentioned, just like on the radio, you should get credit for it. Yeah. So I believe you should, definitely. And by no means, you know, none of us are lawyers up here, um, but we are giving each other food for thought on some really things. As you were speaking, Adele, I was thinking about 
just some regular pop culture things that have happened that amplify this conversation about, okay, we're going to have to learn a whole lot more about AI than we ever probably wanted to <laughs> because this is just where we are. But I think about um, a video clip I saw with Will I Am talking about likeness mm -hmm. and being able to own that. Um, but then I think about like NFL contracts or NBA contracts yeah. um, where they have to, you know, part of their contract is give their likeness over to like video games um, that show them, you know, in various, you know, shapes and forms and, and, and movement. That was a conversation that my students brought to the table last week when we were kind of talking about some things. I think about the whole, was it a, I don't know if it was a single or album with Drake his likeness, it was, he was not even involved with it. And there's a whole um, work created with his likeness and his sound and his, his style and you know his cadence and everything about Drake where people thought it was Drake. Um, those are some like right now concerns that yeah. it's already happening. I can only imagine 10 years from now, you know, what that looks like. And so we legislatively, a lot is going to have to come down the pipeline really, really, really soon. But I also think about this is what feeds fears and concerns about moving too quickly yeah. with technology before it's ready for the marketplace, before it's ready for society. Because everyone may not be having these conversations about ethics and morals. They're just going to run with it. So it's valid. We've got concerns. There are some kinks to work out. There are fears that are there. But I want Ojo to speak from your point of view. What are some wonderful benefits that AI has for us right now and in the immediate future in the creative economy from your point of view? Okay, I will use my project that I worked on. Um, so I could give like more light on that, more light on that. So the project was meant to automate movie scripts so we could have proper age appropriate content and we should be able to like um, automate the genres for movies without having um, other people sit down and then decide on these movies. Um, I would say um, the positives of AI um, AI works by uh, pattern recognition. It just um, it captures an image, it checks details, and it puts all the images together, and then it releases an output that is somewhat related to what it has learned from prior information that it has gotten. So, um, in there's, there's so many benefits. Um, you can talk about how um, now, like with the automation that I have done, um, you could actually um, put in a movie script and then you get like the age appropriate content for that movie based on the um, information that I had given it before, like the, the way I pulled the models before. You can have other things like your phones, your iPhones, how um, it helps you to um, make information, like information that you give um, on your phone. There are so many things that you could do. We could also talk about how AI has helped um, when we talk about the movie, the, sorry, when we talk about the, um, our phones, our like lights every day. And then we use it these days for jobs. There are people who, um, they use this to filter through um, a lot of information that comes in, that helps people to get like just the, major information. Then we have chat GPT this day where chat GPT helps to channel information and we have all these um, data systems, security systems. This is all guided by AI. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think about chat GPT and a couple of things you, you just said. Um, I definitely can see AI as a tool for efficiency, for mm -hmm. sorting through large uh, data sets or content to, you know, maybe support something in a job function or role you already have. I don't know. I mean, I'm just a choir of one, so let me just say that first. I don't know if I want AI being the jury for a film festival selection. That, when I know it could, but then that scripture popped in, and maybe it's not a scripture, maybe it's a saying, but 
all things that are lawful to us are maybe not expedient for us. Um, I don't know. That, that oh, one, yeah. I'm not ready for, but it could be very helpful maybe for some groups. And the other one... Because then hmm. it's like, what is it basing? Because now I want to know the training on? model. Yes. Right. So <laughs> I would think it's basing it on the efficiency of how the script the is, criteria yeah, yeah. It's structured and it's hitting those three act beats at the right time and I could but that. yeah art is so much more than the structure of a, a piece and sometimes people take chances and they create scripts outside the norm of the structure of a script yeah and it becomes a beautiful piece of art that you can only it, art, art gives you feelings, right? That's it. That, that's why art is created, for a feeling, to give you a feeling of something. And I just don't yeah. see how a computer can give you a feeling. It can judge the structure, but it cannot judge how that art affected its audience, which is how most movies are judged. <laughs> I can say one benefit, because at first I was going to say treatments neither. They don't need to be churning out treatments and scripts. But I will say, I have played around with ChatGPT. When I have had projects where I got stuck, mm -hmm. like I'm just trying to figure yeah. out what's this missing piece that could be. I have put prompts into like a yes. ChatGPT and I'm like, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. Hmm. Then I choose how I move with right. that. So... <laughs> Definitely, I can see some benefits I when too. used responsibly. Yeah, I've used it yeah. to help me reword my bio. Okay. You know, students are doing it for resumes. Yeah, yeah. just yeah, like yeah, I yeah. have this wording, but I feel like it maybe it can be worded differently. Right, right, right. Let me see what they say, and then they'll say something, and I'll be like, "Oh, I like that word." Yes. So I'll use yes. that word. Yes. You know what I mean? So what we don't want is like a whole. Benefits. You input this is the assignment, and then yeah. the output I submit. Like, that becomes very, very problematic. I'm sure, <laughs> but it's like, how do you stop that? That's, it. just speaking from a student standpoint. Yeah. Like, that's, that's a whole can of words. Yeah, it's efficiency. <laughs> yeah. We want the kids yeah. to be efficient. They got to go out in life. They, you know, time is money. Yeah. And da, 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 da. But we want them to know how to do the work. Yeah. If, if you graduate from this university with a degree in A, B, or C, you should be competent enough to yes. deliver the work of A, B, and C and not rely on, you know, any kind of tool for that. But let's bring a delay into the conversation, <laughs> too. What are your thoughts about where we're going, finding the benefits of AI in your work? What have you seen so far? Um, well, I mean, I, I think well, what I was thinking of right now is actually maybe to add on to what I was going to say was also, you know, in terms of, I think we're talking about writing, mm -hmm. and I'm just, I, I know now that people are fighting, especially actors and writers, are fighting for um, their rights because AI is taking over their jobs in terms of having these space in film, um, and things like that, you know, and, and the thing is that the companies sometimes, I mean, I know as, a, for me as a creative, I'm getting the, a lot of input, I'm getting a lot of things, but you're also cutting people out who, who you have hired and do those jobs for you. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, at the end of the day, you know, who is it really benefiting? You know, is it you as an individual? I mean, when you are writing this job application, and just to let you know, they have job applicants or job jobs. They have um, technology. They know that tax is for you. <laughs> they know. Say that so, part again. They know what? They know that you. Know, they know that you put your your paper through an algorithm. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> So when you submit your paper, they're like, okay, this is not, mm -hmm. you know. So, I mean, and it's like almost a catch-22. Yeah. You know, it helps you. You know, what, it, I mean, for me, reading right now, it helps me, like, okay, you know, writing, like, you know, short things. But after a while, you like, you know, you lose your, as you said, you lose your humanity. <coughs> you lose who you are. Um, you can't, you're not developing your skills. Even your reading, all, all, and you become almost useless, in a way. Mm -hmm. Because when it's time for you to now communicate, and execute your thoughts, you're so dependent on chat mm -hmm. And I think that's what's going on. Um, especially for us older folks, you know, they love chat to be you know, but for the youth, I'm even scared for them. Like, would they be able to develop their skills, mm -hmm. you know, as an artist, as, you know, as an engineer? 
uh, if you're constantly depending on technology, you know, technology is meant to make things good and on, all, automated for you. Right. But in terms of humanity, yes, I believe that there's no that no real humanity in terms, even in terms of like getting to schools, applying for jobs. It doesn't doesn't really. I mean, has anybody ever used this this thing to get a job? That's, I I, mean, I don't know the outcome of mm -hmm. it. It helps someone. <laughs> With an award, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because everyone is using it. You know, there's no, there's no difference. You know, it's probably, you know, the paper you submit is probably like ten people behind you. So um, we need to find a way of putting that into it. We need to take control. We need to just step up our game and start thinking a bit differently, innovate ourselves, especially as women. Try to innovate ourselves. Try to learn these technologies too to help us in a different way. Yeah. Not in the same way. You know, just try to keep on trying and keep on learning. I think we're very much so in this space of going back old school music industry. When Napster came on the scene and, and that peer to peer file sharing transformed the music industry. But there was this season, a long season, of wanting to just fight it, making it just a piracy fight. It was some time before it was embraced that this is the direction that music is going. We're dematerializing vinyl, eventually the CDs and cassettes and all that too, mm -hmm. and going to these MP3 files, you know, and embracing it. It took some time mm -hmm. for the industry to just say, "This is what it is." <laughs> now we we have mon we have downloads, we have streaming, you know. Now, amazingly, vinyl is making this nostalgic comeback, but I digress. It is, <laughs> in a way, more, it's generating more revenue than, than downloads right now. Vinyl is. But streaming is still the force. You know, it's the tour de force that came out of that music industry disruption. And so I don't know exactly what we will see in film or TV or music or gaming or digital media in terms of the AI revolution. Um, but I will say we have to become and remain students of it mm -hmm. for a season because it is the future. Uh, it's already in our present. But the same way we started seeing legislation change a little bit um, around that disruption, and, and it still needs to change <laughs> some more. Um, and the same way we're starting to see these lawsuits pop, pop up now, it's driving the conversation that we need to have beyond laws. The, because for me, derivative works are a big thing, you know. Derivative works, works coming from someone else's, I personally feel like that's the battlefield mm -hmm. for AI. It's multiple derivative works generating a new thing. Yeah. Um, and crediting those people, if that's even gonna become a thing, I don't know. But I would just add this and then I wanna give Ojo an, another um, floor for some things I'm thinking about with you. Uh, there was this artist whose work was on Instagram. I don't even remember his name right now and I don't need to say it. But I just fell in love with all his posts and I started following him. And I, It was a year into the journey with this artist that I just kept saying, those black babies are so beautiful. These kids are, and it was animated works. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, this is gorgeous. Every time he posts, he gets better and better. And I finally started reading the comments closer and found out it was all AI. Wow. I said, wait a minute now. <laughs> I'm thinking like, should I DM yeah. him about illustrating some stuff for me? I think that work can be useful when we're ideating and we need images to tell a story that we're pitching. Mm -hmm. But then it needs to be replaced by the work of a real artist or illustrator doing that work mm -hmm. and getting credited. So I do see the benefits mm -hmm. from a developmental stage. When you're at home, not wanting to pay a bunch of people while you're still figuring stuff out. But once you get that storyboard, that treatment, you know, that, that pitch deck or whatever it is you're creating to where it needs to be, then bring the creatives, you know, who are part of the collaborative tradition. Bring them back into the equation. That's how I see it right now. Now, if we talk five years from now, I might say something else because I'm going to learn more and, and understand more. But um, Ojo, thoughts on that? I mean, these, this is, you know, I tap dance in the world of the geeks and the world of the creatives, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly comparing these two. But what are your thoughts with what I just said? 
more responsible use of AI with not getting rid of the creative's tradition being part of collaborative works. What are your thoughts on the extent to which it should be used? Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. To what extent do you think AI tools should be used when we compare and contrast creative works and collaboration? Okay, I would like to point out that AI can never work on its own. Um, it always has to have somebody driving it. And when, I talk, when you talk about collaborative work, um, ideas can come into place. The, 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 what we do not have, um, what, what I would say is a major concern is the ability of it to cover all of the, the collaborative work that is needed. And then there is no, there's no originality in the piece. This is just AI doing the work. And then because AI lends like it's just a pattern system it just gives you the same thing over and over and over again mm -hmm. so i would say for collaborative work it is important that people work together and even if you're using ai the driving force behind it should be ideas originality from different people put together to create a, a piece of work otherwise it's just going to be the same thing i would give an example of um, what Kerry just mentioned when she said that there's no empathy, there's no emotion attached to it. Um, because it's a pattern recognition system, yes, you can train the AI to pick up um, patterns from um, in, like rom-coms, like a lot of rom-coms together, and then it will give you like an output that has mm -hmm. rom-coms. But then AI doesn't really <coughs> know how to decide what is good and what is bad, and then the information being given may be bad information. It can't really figure this out on its own. It needs collaborative work. It needs people to come together, bring the ideas together, polish this idea, and bring out something really nice, unique. Yes, That's I, I, think. I agree with that. That supervised versus unsupervised use of it, absolutely. Um, Adele, if, if I understood some research I did on you recently, <laughs> You have this Nigerian Jamaican heritage, is that correct? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Talk to us about <laughs> Talk to us a little bit. If you've given this some thought, if not unpack it with us now, we'll go down this rabbit trail together. But talk to us about your thoughts about telling the stories that come to mind for you as a creative, um, whether it's three D or some other mode. As you tell stories about your culture, your people, your family, or even speculative fiction, does the use of AI come to mind immediately? And how do you kind of see that might evolve for you over time? Oh, okay. So, um, oh yeah, this is really like this real opportunity. That's why I love the um, the platform that we're doing. Has the ability of using technology and art and combining that and expanding the imagination. Um, I, I mean, Jamaican Nigerian mix is a hot mix. You know? <laughs> like, it's a hot, I, I, I don't even want, maybe I should say it's a hot mess. Hot mix and a hot mess. <laughs> hot mix and a hot mess, got it. <laughs> But I mean, I took that I took that in stride because um, I I'm fortunate to also come from a royal family who had, who had a lot of historical background in the Yoruba community, and I use that thought with my mom coming from Jamaica, slaves going to um, going to the Caribbean. Um, I also use that in my thesis when I when I went to architecture school. I did um, um, things on the Yoruba gods. Ah. Mm -hmm. I did my thesis on the Yoruba gods. Mm -hmm. So when I got this job, I was given the ability to um, to meet your character. I had a, 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 we had a topic called meet your character, and I said, well, this is my time. I want to use to to use these tools that have been given to me. I right now I, I have the tools of using generative AI as the tools of using Unreal Engine mm -hmm. um, and uh, Mid Journey and um, and some other augmented reality platforms. And um, it was a good experience because because of my my education and my historical background, 
I started feeding the models the information I had, um, the story of my people. I wanted the skin to look like, um, you know, like African art, African art, African art that comes from the Yorubas. The Yorubas mainly use like bronze, and there's always some form of texture. The patterns in the um, the woman's skin was data. So that data set was within the skin that tells the story and history of her people. She was a strong woman, but she encapsulates all the history that has been embedded. Because you see me, you don't know, you don't know who I am. But within my DNA, they should do a DNA. They can now extract that. I'm mm. here, I'm there, and that. So I use that data and visual data in terms of the, in the journey of AI and the images that came out was absolutely beautiful. Because I created my own data set and the images that the mid journey and the um, other forms of um, generative AI, it was amazing. And it's because of what I told it to do. As um, you know, we're just talking about, you know, we need to take control of what we put in, and what you put in is what you get out. So uh, it was very creative. Um, it was, I mean, I, you know, if you, I, I don't have everything to show you. I, I, I hope you have seen what I, I created. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, I think it's absolutely, um, the African people, it was a gay man job. Gay man job was now a futuristic woman who held all the data of her people. Um, now, present, now, and the future. So it was, for me, generative AI it worked out quite well. Adele, I have not seen it, but I would like to. Is it publicly available somewhere? Um, well, I did a feature with Adobe and um, um, I think Moji has a, might have the link. Okay. I'll try to put the link on, um, and um, I'll see if I can see. I want to uh, see that. Yeah. The um, recording. I have a recording. I'll send it through. Moji. <coughs> I'll send it through the app. Yes, we would love to see it, and maybe even put it in the chat if you have a link to it while we're talking. If you see it. Okay. I'll, I'll one of the things that came to mind when you were talking and I started thinking about Afrofuturism again and these stories and, you know, how we imagine, you know, ourselves through whatever story lens we want to, mm -hmm. you know, tell. I think about people like Ojo, too. I'm sure like many uh, black people in tech, you're a minority in your space, probably, um, in terms of industry. So even from an Afrofuturism perspective, on making sure we are part of the data sourcing and the training and the supervision of AI tools. Can you speak just a moment about how you got into this space and encourage anybody that's watching or listening to that they might want to consider this as a career field or a pathway for them because it becomes really important that if we're going to harness these emerging tech tools, we've got to not just be practicing with them, we need yeah. to be part, yeah. you know, of Creating. the development of them. So I want to just hear from you about that a little bit. Okay, I, I got into AI because I was interested um, in the future, like how AI influences our lives, how you can use AI in every sphere in life. Currently, I work at a retail company where I help them to analyze their data, make recommendations for them. So AI can be used in any field. Like, mm -hmm. So whatever you're interested in, you can embrace technology in that. If you're interested in law, in HR, whatever field you are in, you can just use AI to help you be more efficient. You can use AI to reduce the amount of workload you have, AI will just help you. I wouldn't say just AI, I would say tech in general will help you right. to make a better decision, reduce your time, and then it is more efficient. We have all these um, things coming up like quantum computing and several other things that it's that anybody who is interested in can just go in. It is just based on your interest. How do you want to make your life better? How do you want to make the life of others better? What impact are you trying to um, to give? And with all this in mind, if you just look at AI, look at technology, you should be able to embrace something to just make your life easy, make the life of another person easy. It all has to do with that, the impact you're trying to make. Right. Very good, very good. How are we doing on time? We're at 208. I want to... 
15 more minutes so we can give the audience the okay. chance to ask questions. Before we do q and I want to close with Terry some thoughts about, I know you're passionate about your work and what you yeah. do. And you are telling stories right now, and I'm sure you've got more that you want to tell in the future. How do you see the impact of what you're doing right now, with and without AI? How do you see it evolving over time? Like when you think about your work five years from now, ten years from now, what impact do you want it to have on the culture? Um, so, I, for me, my impact is the same today and I would assume it would be the same in five years mm -hmm. to make an impact, a positive impact mm -hmm. in changing the how the world is so separated mm -hmm. um, within our own community and beyond mm -hmm. um, by creating images like I said that make that make people think differently that make people challenge the status quo, challenge what we've always been taught because a lot of that is what causes the separation in our own community because people are holding so tight on what we've been taught and fed through the years, generation after generation. And then there's a group of people that are expanding their knowledge beyond what we've always been taught, doing their own research, um, even just in religions and spiritualities. like not necessarily just taking everything that we've always been told as fact and that's what we just live and now expanding and embracing because we have so much at our fingertips right now yeah. to be able to study outside of what we've all what my grandma taught me mm -hmm. you know and um so i i hope to continue to create content that kind of just allows people just a little more grace with each other, a little bit more understanding and compassion with each other, even if we're different. It doesn't matter. And again, I'm talking about within our community itself and beyond. Um, so, you know, continuing to create images uh, where people can see themselves, hear their voice, um, you know, recognize the stories and feel empowered by hearing something that I went through that too or that sounds like my mama or you know I felt that way and because I think that we're always um, just encouraged and, and feel better about ourselves when we feel like we're not alone yeah. and no one really is alone in the way they think or the stories that they have so I think it's important for as many of us to continue to keep creating in this business um, to reach those different audiences, those different stories, because it's the not seeing yourself, not hearing your stories that make you feel alone and secluded and, I don't know, it just limits yeah. ourselves. I love what you said early about challenging the status quo. Yeah. And I hear, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're talking about expansive storytelling. That's the legacy you want to leave. Not just the, repeating the stories we've been exactly. told, but learning more about ourselves and telling new stuff. Which Absolutely. is, apropos, we're talking about emerging tech with your legacy, expansive storytelling. You know, if we can use AI to do that, then we can get light years ahead with, with where we want to see our yeah. people, our community our stories but there is a responsibility yeah. with that as well a day to make the oh, world better absolutely that's, that's it bottom line make absolutely. the world better and you and what's, a, what's really impressive to think about is perhaps your stories at some point are going to be part of an ai data set somewhere that to help train and help inspire so that's that's definitely something to look yes. forward to adele and then ojo before we go to q a what are some closing thoughts for you, you know, the stories you want to tell and the impact you want to leave? Well, I think the good thing about, um, the good thing about AI is that um, you don't have to wait. Um, no, you, don't. And you don't. You don't need anyone's permission and, you, and it's open, most of it's open source. Mm -hmm. You can create your own storyline and you can do your own digital storytelling. You can tell, you, you know, your histories of your people, of the histories of you know who you are and I think you represent it and I think it's time for us to start putting everything down um, positive images of ourselves because when people are looking when people went like my company did 50 years of hip-hop and all they could get was um, 
Where do you want to see uh, your work legacy go? Okay, um, and I would say I would like to make impact to the future generation. We have young people coming in who are not sure of our cultures and the traditions of the people before. And their AI is going futuristic. It's going towards the future, so we're losing touch with all of these things. But if we in AI, we can also embrace all this tradition and the culture, and then we can help teach children history in a more fun and interactive way, where they are willing to accept the people that we are, they're willing to accept who they are, and then also be able to like um, embrace technology in that. For me, that is what I'd like to see in a couple of years. Yeah, I like that. So I want to open the floor now to any questions that you all might have or questions in the chat and Nathan, you can monitor that for us. Yes, sir. <coughs> just a comment first. Um, uh, when you talk about training AI, I think it's important to understand that it, it, it's actually not a separation between using AI and teaching AI. Yeah. Mm, Every user point. teaches AI. And adds more data. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's an important point. Mm -hmm. And I think it may impact your perspective on it. I think the Napster example is a perfect one. Mm -hmm. I, I'll add another one that you're probably aware of is Wikipedia. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> when that came out, the professor said you could not use it. Right. Because right. it wasn't a, quote, sanctioned source. And we right. still say that, though. Yeah. <laughs> That's my <laughs> You're actually making my point. Yeah. Because it is a default dictionary. Yeah, it is. Right? Nobody is. goes to Webster. Where they go? They go mm -hmm. to Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So the point is, technology just takes over, regardless to the positions we take. Yeah. Like you said, yeah. we still say it's not a sanctioned source, yeah. but it is. Right. right. So right. I, I think AI is, is in the same place. So mm -hmm. if you understand when you use it, you're actually teaching it. Mm -hmm. I think it then puts us in a position to control where it goes. And address what she talked about, her company looked for, you know, hip-hop. Exactly. But to your point, not only are the tools training as we use it, we still have to default to the, that original source material that they used to generate it in the first place. We've got to be part of adding that content early enough mm -hmm. so that as it's being trained, it's not years. Completely agree. <laughs> yeah. That's why I use the Wikipedia example. This is true. So then, yeah. so then you create your source. And mm -hmm. if you get it ubiquitous enough, it becomes the default definition mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. rather than chat GPT. And to your point, one good thing about Wikipedia at the end, I tell my students don't use this Wikipedia entry. But go back and look at the sources that are cited, go research those, and you can cite that. And so I can definitely see the responsible use, once again, coming back into the conversation. But, and did you have a question, too, or just well, a comment? Well, I was going to ask, had you considered taking the AI concerns under your personal control and addressing them in your own AI platform? That's my question. Start not in my own AI platform. Right now, I'm still very much so in discovery mode, like a lot of people. I Here's the thing. We talked about students submitting stuff, and it's a generative work. I can recognize some of it because I play with it, too. I'm like, I know how to do this, too, y'all. So I'm still learning and playing around with it. But that's an excellent uh, challenge for me to think about, okay, now what, what's next? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do once you feel like you've learned a little bit? 
Moji. So are there any um, checkpoints in place right now, like in colleges, to deter students from writing like their essays and everything? <laughs> you know, we just had a faculty meeting mm -hmm. about a month ago mm -hmm. where we just started having a conversation about do we have a collective language in our syllabus about how we feel? It's not a point of view that the university is saying you have to take. It's just you have to cite what your point of view is so students have parameters on what I can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And I would be transparent because I'm still learning and I don't know what I don't know. My language right now, until somebody mm -hmm. tells me otherwise, is don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> if it's something that I'm grading, okay. it's not to be used, not even for ideation. Because I, I liken it to something that I discovered about my children. I have a 20 year old and a 14 year old. And the 20 year old, when she was around 10 to 15, she had this anxiety about going into the convenience store to do cash transactions. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's a student at Berkeley College of Music and had always been a straight A student. And I'm like, girl, all you have to do is. And then I, my husband and I had an epiphany one day. We said, we grew up with the candy lady. We've been counting mm -hmm. cash since we were four. Yes. Yeah. So it's nothing to us to pull out cash. That's never been an issue. They grew up in the age of about us pulling out our cards. Now if you pull it out your Apple wallet, that's it. And so we had to be very intentional about teaching basics that came organically to us because it was the culture of Southwest Atlanta where I grew up. And many of you, wherever you're from, there was a candy lady yes. somewhere by your yes. school or your house. Yes. Yes. So cash transactions don't yeah. amp us up. But for my kids, it was like, what if I, you know, they were, what if I don't bring the right change back? What if she doesn't get, you know, they just didn't know, how does this work, you know? And so it just taught me generationally that there are some things we have to handhold and not assume. And I, and I, I, I swear by the fact that the creative economy is, is very um, fluid for people who've been in some kind of economy since they've been children. And so selling stuff, marketing stuff, peddling, <laughs> hustling, for some generations and subsets, it's very natural. Because this is just what, what, what we do. For other generations, it's a very different orientation into it. And so I'm learning, to this gentleman's point, um, to be sensitive differently. Like, like, mm -hmm. And to your point, mm -hmm. Just because this wasn't how I was raised or how I did that's it. Right. Let me not be that old fogey. <laughs> yeah. That's like, no, no, no. Um, but yeah, right now, I want to teach my students the mechanics. Know how to read the whole chapter. Understand what the main idea is. Understand how to write notes. Like, they can do open notes uh, quizzes for me, but they can't do, have open devices. Yeah. If you didn't write it down and put it in your own words and think it through, you don't have the advantage, you know? And that's just old school mechanics that I think will serve them well in this new age of technology. Because if the stuff goes out, we can still churn it out. We can still get the work done with yeah. or without a calculator <laughs> or cash register or AI, you know? Yeah. So that's just me. That's not the position of GSU or CMI. But we're getting there. We're on that journey. Are there. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I guess I, I have a question about like the idea of like kind of digital blackface. I don't know if you guys are, like mm. that. And so like, if, I guess for one, you guys think that AI could be a version of digital blackface, since like we said, anyone can put any information about like, anything in there. I guess like, how are there any regulations? Like, is there a way to actually code ethics into AI? Like, technically, is that possible? I think I know where you're going, but yeah. to amplify the question. Define what you're calling digital blackface. Um, I guess like I've seen like certain articles and stuff about like we recently with social media since how like anyone can post a picture specifically I guess with like certain black people doing things and how it kind of is always like us in some comedic standpoint. A lot of people consider that digital blackface in the sense of like who's posting it or like mm. who's getting like made fun of. Kind of like back in the day with those Karen um, Davis shows. You know how like that mm -hmm. basis, but, like, like menstrual yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess like since AI is anyone can put anything in there, so it's a like just any white person writes anything about like black people, for example, like how can we control that in a sense? Like, can I even be it's, like, it almost feels like culture gatekeepers too. Are they being dismissed? I want to leave this to one of the panelists. What do y'all think about this idea of digital blackface? Any thoughts? I 
she she asked she asked how we felt about were we concerned that AI could become uh, responsible for things like digital blackface and so from that point of view meaning content generated by unknown sources is it really culturally competent meaning I think about something like there was this company using this black model on all of their marketing and promo material and everybody was ranting and raving about how beautiful she was and how diverse this company had moved into the direction blah blah blah. Then they found out it wasn't even a real model. It was an AI generated um, beautiful woman but she wasn't real so she wasn't getting compensated so they really weren't as diverse or supporting. Right. <laughs> you know so I, is that kind of yeah, he's a, 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 a small example of digital blackface. So they're basically saying, is is there a concern about this idea of content being generated? We'll do it from the point of view of black people with blackface, where it's really maybe somebody white behind it or somebody Middle Eastern behind it, but it's being maybe it somebody black behind it. It wouldn't be blackface then, I don't think, right? Would, would we consider a black content curator generating content about black culture being guilty of blackface versus somebody oh, sorry. putting that out there and you're not black and it's a culturally competent content piece. That's that's what I'm thinking about it. Do y'all have thoughts about that? Well, if it's negative, if it's a negative thing, uh, I mean, that's, what that's where ethics come into it. I mean, there's so many things out there that you just don't have to Mm -hmm. in terms of what is put out there. But if it's something quite offensive, um, I, mean, I, I think, you know, laws should be put out. But, I mean, if it's something positive, you know, because you don't need your own people to tell you you're beautiful. Other people can say you're beautiful. If it was a beautiful thing, if it was a positive image that propelled a positive Thing. I think I, I don't think there's anything really wrong with it, mm -hmm. even though if somebody else generated because I could be generating an image of a uh, Chinese lady doing some nice, you know, if I have a good cultural background of what she's doing, it, you know, and that's the job of the artist to create mm -hmm. different ethnic backgrounds, you know, and that's why it's good to have like di a diverse, you know, diverse. If you have like a movie theater or a movie set, it's good to have diverse people. So if the image is positive, I think it's good. If it's a negative image, like maybe she's a drug dealer, or, I mean, that, that's what you constantly project as, uh, you know, for people, I think that's bad. So, but if it's a positive image, I think it's good. There's certain things we don't really have control over, but, you know, for me, in terms of positivity, whoever is doing the character, I, I'm happy with it. Maya, does that kind of touch on yeah, some yeah. of the question you had? Okay, yes. So what's exciting to me about Afrofuturism is about the future. How are we um, how are we working together um, collaboratively challenging one another as creatives to ensure that our present, whether we consider it good or bad, is not infecting our view of the future. How are we working now to ensure that we are elevating ourselves in in how we are projecting ourselves in the future? Wanna take that to Um I you know I can only speak for myself, which everything that I ever been in as an actress anything that I've ever directed, I always have feel the responsibility of making you proud, mm -hmm. of making making my grandma proud, making my eight-year-old daughter proud. And that does not mean that I only like show us that we're goody two-shoes and we make all the right decisions and we are, it's the, telling our stories from my perspective, from my experiences in life. Um, I consider myself a pretty, um, you know, accomplished, um, productive human being to society, 
though I grew up in the hood and all those things. So I have a plethora of stories to tell from childhood to, you know, teenage years, to going to college, to having kids, to going through a divorce, to getting remarried. Like, it's just my life experiences that I feel like I owe to the world as an artist. So I pull on those things in re my real life to pour into characters or stories or my perspective as a director. Um, and I feel like as long as I'm, I'm doing that to honor the culture, to honor women, men that look like me, um, no matter what age, all the way from my grandmother who's 93, like I said, to my daughter that's eight, like I want to make sure that everyone within that range is proud of the work. Doesn't mean they always agree <laughs> with the story or the character, but it really is for the purpose of elevating us, challenging us. Um, yeah, reflecting, we're a reflection of each other. And I always think about that in everything that I've created. Do we have time for one more question yes, or no? Sure. Let's take one more question. Well, um, actually, it's not a question as much as uh, a comment, so I can see if you want me to. Okay. Yes. <laughs> we can do both. You Let's hear your comment, then we'll take our question. <laughs> this might just date me. The way I see it, um, I, I think we can take some comfort in the constancy of change. Mm -hmm. For those that know about uh, typewriters, <laughs> yeah. the manual ones. Yes to when the electric typewriters yeah. came along yeah. and then the computers yes. and, and here we are today. We're talking about uh, AI. And the, the two uh, panelists, uh, I, I commend you uh, particularly because of the shared heritage. There is hope. Yes. That's my, my comment on yes. this AI business. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank um, you. Oh, I, I think everybody will be able to hear me. <laughs> yes. um, my, my question is, I guess, mostly geared for Terry because you, um, you fit this beautiful kind of um, balance between, you know, being an actress in film as well as creating content. Um, you know, I'm, I'm of Caribbean descent. I was born in the Virgin Islands. And one of the things that concerns me about AI is the fact that in the media, historically, in American media, and I'm, I'm gonna only focus on that because that's the bulk of what I know, um, the, the black experience hasn't necessarily been expressed in, in a holistic, healthy way. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, there's a panel of, of African descended women here, in particular our story hasn't necessarily been expressed as diversely and as healthily as I think we would like. I think most, most, most people of African descent would say that. My concern with AI is, um, is do, do any of you feel like that would create an additional barrier of preventing or prohibiting our stories to be told in the way that we would like it to, because you know we know that any anyone can enter data into the system. That data can then be spit out and manipulated in whatever way AI deems to use it. And then with the current situation right now happening, um, you know, with the Writers and Actors Guild, um, the the concern over AI taking over voices and our voices being marginalized as it is, like I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Um, I work in film, I'm, I, I do not work in, in the creative side, I work in the locations department, I'm fairly new to that, but my, my world has been opened up in a, in a sense now that I'm, I'm in the industry, I'm seeing and I'm understanding things from a very different perspective, from a, a bit of a more of an internal perspective. So my, my question is, do we have faith in the ability for this technology to be utilized in a way that doesn't further diminish our voices or misconstrue who we consider ourselves to be as diverse and as uh, beautiful and as as 
vast as we are as a diaspora. Like that's that's my thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I really connected with everyone's concerns over um, uh, the humanity aspect, the intellectual aspect, what makes people people, that individuality, the culture, the history, the stories. Like how, how do we feel about that? Like how do you guys feel about that? Um, well, I, I, I mean, you hit on points that <laughs> I feel like I've been making yeah. um, all day. Like that is my concern. Everything that you're saying is also my concern. But to this gentleman's point of having hope in the future, um, and, and after listening to these brilliant ladies, because I am not a tech person <laughs> at all, I am not, but after, you know, listening to them and hearing them talk about it, um, you know, Adele H talked about putting in um, image of a black woman mm -hmm. and, and the images that came up were not images that reflect what she was looking for or that she knows as a black woman. Um, so I just think with time, and the other gentleman mentioned more of us using it and it's gathering data from what we're putting in, right? Um, I think with time that will be, you know, maybe presentable in a way, but that is my concern for right now what's happening because it has to grow into that. Um, so I think maybe one of them can answer it better than what I, because I'm a <laughs> civilian. Oh, Joe right. Adele, either one of you want to add on to that? Um, for me personally, I think that um, AI will make a positive impact, um, because if you, let's say take one day after the other. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> If you if you look at it carefully, you you can use AI to help underrepresented um, cultures to put their voices out there, make them more um, like make them make their voices more audible, throw more light with that. Mm -hmm. Because currently um, we have a lot of cultures that are not represented. We have a lot of information that is there that is really biased at the moment. And because of these biases that exist, the information that we have there, the, the, the uh, information that is generated currently is not a direct proportion of what is happening in our world right now. But with continuous like improvement, like with more information being added into this data, and we then with a proper like they need to like engineer the data, like they need to do proper engineering of this data before this data is trained to these models. If what, by the time these things are put in place, all the regulations that are needed to be put in place, like the amount of information, and then who puts this information in? Because there's no moral ethical code that actually, um, put, um, moral ethical code that actually um, watches this data. But with all this put into place, I think AI will be like, something that would help the movie industry, help generate movies that are impactful. But we, with, with the way we are right now, where the information that is in is still not regularized and that there's no moral ethical code, I wouldn't say that AI is at that point. <coughs> Adele, did you want to add on to that at all? Well, yeah, I want to add because, um, I mean, I am enjoying working in um, generative AI, but I, I, I am concerned about the future because right now it's at its infancy, and the way they're training this AI, I mean, we probably don't really know what it can do, and everything you see in scientific movies or science fiction movies actually come true because, I mean, back in the day, talking to someone on the screen was, like, impossible. I mean, that was imaginary, you know? I'm like, yeah. oh, they can talk to people on screen. Now, look at what we're doing. So, um, oh, we're AI, they're training it. It's a baby right now. It's mm -hmm. turned into a monster. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we have to take control. Um, even though we don't want to put data out there, I know most of us are scared of putting who we are on the internet. But, you know, um, these are, when you're applying for jobs, these are, you know, I don't know about scraping. 
they, uh, they've trained the models to scrape the internet, to look for images, to see who's there, to who you know who you are. So if you don't put yourself out there, I mean, it's, it's almost a sacrifice. You need to put your information out there. You need to put yourself out there. Or you have to take that. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. It's, it's very hard. Either you put yourself out there or you come like the Matrix and go underground and <laughs> you're nobody and right. <laughs> you get left out. Right. You know, either you're in or you're out. I mean, that's, that's the, the systematic way of thinking. Right. And we're in the system. So. And I would just say. Up our game. I would just say, like, in closing, because that was a great question to close out on, and everybody has given some great points of view. Um, Teresa Clark, uh, who's formerly from the finance world, she has lived in South Africa, I think, the last 30 years. She did a TED Talk somewhere around 2017, 2018. It was called Bridging the Diaspora Divide. Mm -hmm. And when I think about Afrofuturism, and as well as this layer of artificial intelligence on top of it, you know, the hallmark of that TED Talk changed my life because it just made me think about myself as a global citizen. Mm -hmm. If you've never gotten a chance to watch it, watch it. It's an amazing, what, 15, 18 minutes. Um, but she, she posits that black people outside of the African continent are the minority wherever they live. Um, and even with Brazil being the largest representation of black folk, outside the continent, there is still so much division in how we view ourselves from an identity perspective. Mm -hmm. But she posited, if we thought of ourselves as global citizens of the diaspora mm -hmm. and, and allies yeah. to people on the African continent, our geopolitical power amplifies exponentially. Yes. And then we stop seeing ourselves as marginalized and seeing unity as this, this lens or, or vehicle through which we can do the things that we've only imagined. And it has transformed my life. I started going to the continent that same year. And I've probably made seven or eight trips at this point. And every time I go, my, my intention is to build community. I'm not a tourist anymore. You know, I go to build relationships, community, and projects. And then I dovetail it with the other work that I do. So when I found out we had a gap with study abroad programs in my department, I said, I'll do our first one. So I took 16 students to Ghana in May. And this is one of my students who's with us. And they weren't tourists either. It's called the Creative Economy, Culture, and Tourism. While we were studying tourism and how the diaspora is positioned in that country as part of the, the tourist experience, you know, it's, it's both a pilgrimage and it's a learning mm -hmm. and community building experience, but they created content for the tourism authority. Mm -hmm. They had to tell their stories while they were there. Then I had to challenge them, don't create tourism promos. Mm -hmm. Tell your story as you are experiencing it for the first time visiting this country. And everybody was African American except for maybe four or five of the 16. One was Nigerian American, one was Kenyan American, uh, one was actually Japanese American and one was um, European American. And they could not be silent either. I said, because you're watching something happen in real time. Document that with us. Tell your story mm -hmm. too. And collectively, this diaspora story becomes this Afrofuturistic mm -hmm. elevation to your, both your questions. Um, our collaboration once we get outside our comfort zone, like Terry yeah. was saying earlier, and tell stories that our grandmothers couldn't tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as global citizens, we can if we get outside of our box. I can yeah. see AI helping us to compress 500, 600, 700 years of missed history from each other. My Ghanaian and Tanzanian and Zanzibari friends will say, for a long time, the way we saw y'all was you were here then you became enslaved, then you were free, and why can't you get it together? Mm -hmm. I appreciated their candor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what they thought. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. all they saw. And you were either Jay-Z and Beyonce, or you were incarcerated, strung yeah. out on drugs, or yes. living on welfare. They didn't see the wealth of stories that are already in existence. But if we can bridge that diaspora divide with this tool, yes. I say it's a win. Yeah. Let's tell the stories about us, and they can tell their stories so we understand 
our parallel journeys and come to this place of convergence that elevates us. So that's that's I want to close yeah, on that. Good. Is that good? That was amazing. All right. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Adele and Ozo. Oh, Moji, yes. yes. I wanted to respond. What's your name, please? L. L. I wanted to respond to L. So, most people don't know this. My background is actually in IT. My first degree is in computer science. My second degree is in intelligent systems. And then I did a master's in West African studies. So, I have one foot in the film world, one foot in the IT world. I'm also somewhat of an entrepreneur. So, I want to put this to you and to most people that the new world of AI is a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's a business opportunity. One of the things we should, people and the younger, you know, girls especially in particular, need to get more into STEM, start, you know, one. Um, Thank you. We have to start thinking about how we can turn this into business opportunities. Collective <laughs> data is a huge, I mean, it's a huge, huge, huge industry. You know, so even as simple as terrain, maybe? Yes. Oh, that's a picture. Take some pictures. Oh, let's take some pictures with me. So I'll come back and continue, but um, we have to look at it, I think, as a business opportunity, yeah. even as simple as stock footage. There mm are -hmm. lots of people now that are getting into that business of creating stock footage with people um, of African descent. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that because I think. Um, you know, we are, yes, we must talk about the problems, our fears, mm -hmm. but what are the solutions kind of thing? Because I'm a solution person, that's my IT background. Thank you for that. Yes. Thank Thank you. 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 Thank you.